Buenos dias a todos, todas e oh, todas. Tenho o honor de declarar aberta esta audiência pública número 9 sobre a situação de los direitos humanos de las pessoas LGBTI em El Caribe. Ah, em nome da Comissão Interamericana, saludamos Outright Action International por la solicitude. Hoje, nos acompanha a comissionada Margaret M. McCauley, que é relatora para o tema dos direitos humanos das mulheres e, ademais, para os direitos humanos dos afrodescendentes e afrodescendentes. Ah, também, Julissa Mantilha, que é comissionada, relatora para o tema de los direitos das pessoas maiores e também direitos de la mobilidade humana, migração, migrantes. A Petro Vaca, que é o relator especial para a liberdade de expressão. Nosso comissionado Estuardo Halon, que é comissionado e relator para o tema de la, de la, de la, de los direitos das pessoas privadas de liberdade e direitos das pessoas com discapacidade. Também estendo um saludo muito cordial, muito especial à nossa querida secretária executiva interina, Maria Cláudia Polido, e também a todo o equipo da Relatoria para os Direitos das Pessoas LGBTI, Miguel Mesquita, Manuel, Rota, e toda, todo o equipo da Comissão Interamericana de Direitos Humanos. A metodologia desta audiência regional será a seguinte. Empezamos com a palavra à la sociedade civil por 30 minutos. Depois, a comissão terá 30 minutos para observações, comentários, perguntas. Novamente, a palavra será otorgada à sociedade civil. E, finalmente, aí cerramos. Por favor, agora tenho o honor de ceder a palavra à la sociedade civil para a sua intervenção em el plazo de 30 minutos. Por favor. Gracias. Muchas gracias, comisionada. Good morning. Good morning, distinguished commissioners, the secretariat, everyone who's joining us today, everyone who will hear this recording uh, after this hearing. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for convening this thematic hearing called the Conversion Practices, the Caribbean Story. My name is Luisa Drummond Veado. I work for Outright Action International and its United Nations program together with my colleague, Matt. Russo, who's also here today. Also have Amy Bishop, our senior research advisor, Caleb Steban, assistant professor at Sciences University, and Susan Dorson, executive director of Women, Women's Way Foundation. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that Outright works at the international, regional, and national levels to research, document, defend, and advance human rights of LGBTIQ people around the world that we have staff in six countries and we work alongside LGBTIQ individuals across four continents towards lasting change. That we partner directly with human rights defenders, allies and organizations to produce reliable data and experiences of LGBTIQ people around the world and support research-based advocacy, capacity building for human rights of LGBTIQ people. I'd also like to take a second to do a trigger warning for this hearing because we'll be talking about something that's very particular about conversion practices. So if you do not want to hear about this, please leave this hearing or do not continue watching this video. Um, I'd like to start saying that in 2019, Outright Action International launched a report called Harmful Treatment of Research of Conversion, Conversion Therapy. And, and that was a global report. We only 20 answers for carry. In that way, we decided to do a Caribbean research itself. We had a survey that was distributed in English and Spanish in all 31, including the 12 dependent territories with close ties to Europe and the United States. We had a total of 100 people from 17 collected between 10th of January 2020 and 15th of February 2020. After that survey, we had 20 in-depth interviews that were conducted online with persons from Belize, Guyana, Haiti, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Suriname, Puerto Rico, Antigua and Barbuda, Dominican Republic, and St. Lucia. Two of those interviewees are here today to talk about their experiences. 
Uh, one last comment before I give to my, the word to my colleagues. I want to acknowledge that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its reports on violence against LGBTI persons and the Americans has mentioned the dangers of the conversion practices in the region. And during the more 10 years of the existence of the LGBTI rapporteurship, we've seen a lot of development and a lot of work done, including the two new reports that mention the influence of fundamentalist groups attacking LGBTI rights, and also the consultation in the Caribbean together with the independent expert on SOGI to highlight the realities on the ground in the region of the Caribbean. However, after seven years of the violence report, we believe that focusing on conversion practices should be one of the priorities in the works of the LGBTI rapporteurship. And I pass the word to my colleague, Amy Bishop. Thank you so much, Louisa. Yes, good morning. My name is Ami Bishop. Um, I'm the Senior Research Advisor, as Louisa said, for Outright Action International. Um, thank you again so much for inviting us uh, here today. Um, in the few minutes that I have, I'd like to just briefly summarize some of the key points from our global research uh, on this topic, which Louisa mentioned, um, and also provide some specific data from our recent work in the Caribbean. Um, before I begin to summarize the data, I just want to say a few words about terminology. The practices that we're discussing are commonly referred to in English as conversion therapy to describe often psychologically and physically harmful attempts to repress, change, or cure diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. Although this is the language that is most widely in circulation, it's highly flawed. The word conversion implies that LGBTIQ people can be changed, which is neither true nor necessary. And these practices are most certainly not therapy, since being LGBTIQ is not a pathology, but rather expressions of completely normal diversity of human sexuality and identity. So we prefer to use the term sexual orientation and gender identity or expression change efforts, SOGI change efforts or, or practices, or at least so-called conversion therapy. So in 2019, as Louisa mentioned, Outright Action International published the first ever research on the global reach of so-called conversion therapy, which was based on an extensive literature review, a global survey representing 500 responses from about 80 countries uh, and 19 in-depth interviews with survivors from 11 countries. Uh, our objectives at that time were to characterize who's most vulnerable, what are the main forms of SOGI change efforts, who are the main promoters and perpetrators, and how these practices impact survivors. So just in brief, our data suggest that these practices are occurring nearly everywhere in the world. Uh, Louisa mentioned that there were just 20 responses from, Lat from the Caribbean. All told, we had 44 from the Latin America and Caribbean region. So of those 51%, um, so about half, believed that so-called conversion therapy practices were very or somewhat common. Uh, about 22% of all the respondents had experienced some form of so-called conversion therapy themselves. Of those who endured these practices, two thirds were coerced, while about a third had sought them out themselves. And the vast majority of people who underwent these practices were 24 or younger, with the majority being actually between 18 and 24. Religion, broadly, was the reason most frequently cited as the driver behind SOGI change efforts, with religious leaders or institutions being the primary promoters and perpetrators in combination or partnership with families. This was particularly true in Latin America and the Caribbean and in Sub-Saharan Africa. The dominance of religion combined with family pressure was also reflective in the interviews, reflected in the interviews. Many respondents referred to being prayed over, taken for deliverance, being anointed with oils, being confined, forced to fast or dry fast, meaning no water, or having to undergo exorcism rituals. In some cases, religiously based efforts, change efforts became violent and abusive, especially for lesbians and transgender people where praying rituals devolved essentially into sexual assault. Interviewees from the Latin American Caribbean region specifically described being forced to undergo abusive religious uh, rituals 
as well as to endure verbal abuse or being hospitalized and subjected to de degrading so-called treatments. A transgender man from Chile told me, that, I remember that I was tied to a bed. They used electric shock, two months in the hospital. I don't remember how often they were. I remember was crying. I started telling everyone that I was a girl so that they would let me leave. I did transition for six years after the hospital because I was very afraid. So it took me six years to be who I am, to say I want to transition because I was terribly afraid to be. Our data supported existing evidence that these harmful practices never work and instead cause deep lasting trauma. Many respondents spoke of profound feelings of self-hatred, depression, suicide, suicidal ideation. Interviewees spoke of feeling dirty, of deep feelings of shame, humiliation, wanting to die, wishing they'd never been born. In several cases, interviewees described multiple attempts at suicide. Interviewees also talked about the need for education and awareness about the harms of Sochi change efforts, specifically citing the need to target religious leaders, parents, and mental health providers. Several noted, importantly, that efforts to eradicate conversion practices should not be pursued in isolation of broader efforts to gaining social acceptance and religious uh, acceptance as well, and to de decriminalize consensual same-sex relations where, there's, where those laws still stand. Of relevance to this audience, two of the five countries in the world uh, that have national bans against so-called conversion therapy are Brazil and Ecuador. Brazil's law, the longest standing in the world since 1999, was initiated through a resolution by the Psychology Federation. It was challenged in 2017, but upheld, and in a country with a huge number of psychologists, it's played a very important role. In Ecuador, it's been illegal since 2014 for a professional to offer or perform conversion practices on any person. Uh, regardless whether or not compensation is received in exchange. The push for a ban was initiated in 2011 by a group of Ecuadorian human rights organizations who petitioned the Ministry of Health to close down so-called dehomosexualization clinics that reportedly were using corrective rape, beatings, electric shock, lengthy solitary confine confinement to cure same-sex attraction. Enforcement of this ban remains a concern, however, as reports persist that about 200 unlicensed clinics are still in operation, largely as clandestine private drug and alcohol clinics, and they do remain a lucrative business. Since publishing the global report and as a follow-up to our initial findings, I pursued additional research in the Caribbean and in Sub-Saharan Africa. So now I'll spend a few minutes just to share some of the findings from the Caribbean region. As Louisa mentioned, the data I share, uh, I'll share are drawn from a regional survey conducted this year with about 100 respondents from 17 Caribbean countries, plus 20 in-depth interviews with survivors, as well as input from regional civil society members and experts. The findings of this report substantiate the major findings of the global report that I just described. So just as you well know, for, con for context, LGBTIQ people face significant challenges in the Caribbean where socio-cultural realities provide for the existence and prevalence of conversion practices. Over half the countries in the region still criminalize same-sex relations under so-called buggery laws left over from British colonial rule. Uh, and the existence of these laws continues to perpetuate negative and misleading perceptions of LGBTIQ people as disordered or even criminal. Even where buggery laws do not exist, there's no legislation that explicitly bans discrimination or provides protections on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. Conservative churches exert powerful influences as well. These conditions then rise to societal perceptions that are staunchly negative at best, and at worst lead to harassment, violence, discrimination, and attempts at converting those per perceived to be either sinful or ill or both. 
For example, findings from a 2015 national survey uh, study con commissioned by the Jamaican Forum for Lesbian and Gays found that 93% of Jamaicans agreed with the statement that homosexuality is a sin. And 61% believed that with professional help, such as conversion therapy, LGBTIQ people could become heterosexual. So on to some more specific findings from our work. Uh, about two thirds, 66% of sur survey respondents indicated that SOGI change practices are occurring in different forms in the countries where they live. About 38% of the respondents agreed that people from all categories of identity within the spectrum of LGBTIQ are vulnerable, while 34% shared that minors are most likely to be subjected to so-called conversion therapy. A bit more than a third of respondents in the survey stated that they themselves underwent conversion therapy, and of these, 32% indicated that they'd chosen to undergo the practices themselves, indicating the profound external pressures, both in society and within families to conform to expected gender norms. Three quarters of respondents identified that religious personnel or organizations are the key promoters and perpetrators of so-called conversion therapy in the Caribbean. And among those who were interviewed, 85% indicated that they were forced to participate in religious rituals and counseling by parents and family members who are deeply religious or have strong ties to the church. The findings also suggest that school counselors and mental health professionals promote and practice so-called conversion therapy. These practices also take place in medical settings. About 20% of respondents identified private mental health, psychiatric or psychological uh, health uh, sorry, psychology health practitioners as carrying out conversion practices with those subjected to such practices typically, typically being referred by family, schools, or state human services departments. As in our global findings, survivors emphasize that the psychological trauma caused by these practices is still very much present in their lives today. So the picture that's painted their findings is that SOGI change efforts are occurring throughout the region and are largely driven by religion. They take place for, hidden from the public eye in churches, solitary counseling rooms, within homes at the hands of family members, using physical, verbal, and sometimes even sexual violence in, a, in an effort to bring about change. And lastly, I just want to highlight that those who remain insistent on engaging in these practices to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity, which no credible scientific body would support, know that the tide is turning against them and they themselves are abandoning the term conversion therapy. Instead, they are hijacking human rights language to promote their services. They use words like freedom and choice and they argue it would be a violation of their professional duty or their religious rights to weigh those seeking help for their unwanted same-sex attraction. We see this happening throughout the world and we ignore these manipulations of language at our peril. Um, I'd like to end with a quote from one of our interviewees that I think perfectly summarizes the, the nature of this issue. They said, Conversion there is not a single event. It is a process of continued degradation and assault on the core of who you are. There are often repeated violations in the form of psychological and sometimes physical abuse. It's not one instance, it's a continued sense of rejection. The pressure is enormous. Thank you very much. Next, I think uh, Caleb, are you coming next? Yes. Okay, I will be presenting in Spanish. Buenos días a todas las personas presentes en este panel y gracias por el espacio y la oportunidad de escucharnos. Soy el Dr. Caleb Esteban, psicólogo clínico y catedrático auxiliar de la Ponce Health Science University. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, could we reset because um, uh, he's overriding the interpreter? Okay. We need to Please, reset. just one moment. Sure. If the staff, if Camila could help or Manuel. Vamos Let's a proceder a reiniciar, comisionada. Is it working right now? 
to speak? Yes. Está escuchando, Margaret? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, sorry, I'd like to apologize. Please, I give you the floor. Don't worry. All right. Um, should I continue or begin again? I suggest you begin, please. And the right. time will freeze during the suspension, <laughs> please. All right. Buenos días a todas las personas aquí. Hello, hello. No? Still. Let me know. So let's try again, please. So time is not counting. No, no damage. <laughs> ahora, Margaret, puedes escuchar? Escucha ahora? Escucha I'm trying ahora? to do it. I'm trying. I'm trying. I suggest then Camila could bilaterally solve the problem with you. Could I, be can, or Luciana. I can hear you, but yes? under his voice. So I, okay. I, I need to so my suggestion would be off in Spanish. if you do agree oh. that bilaterally Camila or Luciana and está de you, acuerdo. Okay? Try. Could he, speak, okay. could he speak first? Claro, por favor, está escuchando? Margaret? I'm Escucha. hearing you in Spanish. I should not hear you in Spanish. No, no, pero yo estoy... Okay. Ahora. Uh, that's fine. May we proceed? Yes? May okay, we? I will, yeah. I, will, I, I, will, I will listen avidly to the interpreter, even if it doesn't work. That's okay. okay. Go on. Okay. Okay. Please. So, I give you the floor, and now the time starts. Please. Buenos días a todos todas las personas presentes en este panel y gracias por el espacio y la oportunidad de escucharnos. Soy el doctor Caleb Esteban, psicólogo clínico y catedrático auxiliar de la en Puerto Rico. Soy además el coordinador del Comité de la Diversidad de Sexo, Género y Orientación Sexual de la Asociación de Psicología de Puerto Rico. Comienzo informando que el tema del cual hoy conversamos es uno sensitivo para mí, ya que fui víctima de las terapias reparativas cuando tenía alrededor de 15 años. Fue un momento muy difícil para mí, ya que fui a buscar ayuda y terminé peor de cómo llegué. Este proceso fue en la iglesia a la que asistía. A pesar de que me identificaba como bisexual desde los 12 años, no fue hasta los 15 años que me enamoré de otro hombre. Esto trajo cuestionamientos en mí y en mi identidad espiritual. Así que asistí a terapia simplemente para hacer una pregunta. A pesar, <coughs> a pesar de que la terapeuta en la primera cita me dijo que era algo normal para mi edad, me mencionó que me quería seguir viendo. Salí muy contento de esta sección al saber que no había nada malo en mí. Sin embargo, en la segunda cita, la terapeuta me menciona que había consultado y que esto no era algo normal, que al contrario, yo estaba poseído por un demonio. Además, abundó en cómo esto era extremadamente peligroso, ya que este tipo de demonio se pasaba a otras personas con las que estuviera, y que si no lo combatía, se pondría siete veces más fuerte. Entonces las terapias se convirtieron en ayunos y mini exorcismo, en donde ella me, me echaba aceite ungido, y reprendía al demonio fuera de mí. Esto evidentemente infectaba, debido a que no veía que nada pasaba. <coughs> Pensaba que era mi culpa y que ese demonio ya era parte de mí. Decidí abandonar la terapia, ya que me sentí incómodo en el proceso y cada día estaba más confundido. A pesar de lo difícil de este proceso, no se quedó ahí. La terapeuta decidió llamar a todas mis amistades de la iglesia para contarles lo que estaba pasando y exigirles que se alejaran de mí. Algunos así lo hicieron. Dentro de todo este proceso, mis padres nunca fueron consultados. Al estudiar psicología, decidí, descubrí que existían los estudios en orientación sexual y a partir de ahí he tomado todos los cursos posibles sobre el tema. Ahora puedo entender que no había nada mal conmigo sino que ella buscó, abusó de su poder como terapeuta espiritual a pasar de ni siquiera tener un grado. 
para imponer sus creencias en mí y utilizar la intimidación para cumplir sus metas. Esta experiencia me motivó a enfocar mi tema de estudio en minorías sexuales y de género, y de ahí a unirme como estudiante al Comité de la Diversidad de Sexo, Género y Orientación Sexual, comité del cual ahora soy coordinador. Esta plataforma privilegiada me ha dado la oportunidad de, como hombre gay y género no binario, velar por los derechos a acudir a audiencias, a defender leyes que le hacen justicia a mi comunidad. Leyes como la ampliación de personas de, la ampliación de, de matrimonio de personas del mismo sexo, leyes de la violencia doméstica, el derecho a la adopción por parte de personas del mismo sexo y la protección por orientación sexual e identidad de género en el empleo. Sin embargo, otras leyes como el derecho al matrimonio por personas del mismo sexo fueron rechazadas por el Estado de Puerto Rico, pero luego impuestas a nivel de conversión. El gobierno de Puerto Rico tuvo principalmente dos proyectos. El primero, el proyecto del Senado Min del 2018 para enmendar el artículo 1.06 de la ley 104 del 2000, llamada Ley de Salud Mental de Puerto Rico para enmendar los artículos 3 y 41 de la ley 241 del 2011, ley para la seguridad, bienestar y protección de menores, para enmendar el artículo 10 y la ley 20 del 2015, ley de fondos legislativos para el impacto comunitario, a los fines de ampliar protecciones de salud física y mental de los menores de edad, mediante la prohibición de la práctica de terapias de conversión sobre sus personas y otros fines relacionados. Este proyecto, a pesar de ser muy bien intencionado, tenía un gran defecto. Mencionaba que si alguien llegaba a cabo a terapias reparativas, la junta examinadora de esa profesión se encargaría de darle sanciones. Sin embargo, no mencionaba nada de aquellas personas que su profesión no tenía una junta examinadora y mucho menos aquella región que no tenía ninguna regulación ante el Estado. A pesar de que se trajo el problema a las vistas del proyecto, no se hizo cambio alguno, por lo que decidimos no avalar el proyecto, ya que parecía ser intencional dejar una puerta abierta para brindar las terapias. El proyecto no se aprobó. Luego de casi un año, el gobernador en ese momento, luego destituido por el pueblo, demandó que aprobara el proyecto debido a que era parte de su plan de trabajo por lo que se crea un nuevo proyecto que a la vez, eh, que a su vez de comenzar en el Senado, como todos los proyectos, comenzó en la Cámara de Representantes y dirigido por una representante abiertamente homofóbica. El proyecto de la Cámara número 2068 del 2019 se creó para establecer la ley para la prohibición de terapias reparativas y otros fines. Así que ya no era un proyecto para enmendar, sino una ley propia. Este proyecto se quería hacer ilegalmente sin vistas públicas y se lograron llevar a cabo gracias a la presión pública que se hizo por las comunidades y organizaciones. Este proyecto no solo tenía un defecto, sino que a pesar de que prohibía las terapias reparativas, mencionaba explícitamente que la ley no iba por encima de la libertad religiosa ni el derecho de patria potestad de un padre a exigir la terapia para su menor. Evidentemente era una ley que daba el visto bueno a personas religiosas a continuar utilizando las terapias, pero quedaban prohibidas para las personas licenciadas bajo una profesión. A pesar de que las vistas se trajo este gran y conflictivo problema del proyecto, se quedó intacto convirtiéndose en el proyecto del Senado 1254 del 2019 para establecer la ley para la prohibición de terapias reparativas y otros fines. Este conflicto trajo evidentemente varios problemas, incluyendo el debate de la libertad religiosa en la isla, por el cual el proyecto no se aprobó. Por tal razón, el gobernamiento creó una orden ejecutiva número 16 del 2019 para prohibir las terapias de conversión o reparativas para cambiar la orientación sexual o identidad de género de menores de edad. Sin embargo, esta orden no incluye los sectores privados. Nuestro comité no se podía quedar cruzado de manos, por lo que nos movimos dentro de nuestra profesión a enviar cartas a la Junta Examinadora de Psicólogos con nuestras preocupaciones y evidencia científica del daño de las terapias reparativas. 
también continuamos haciendo diversas campañas sobre el daño de las terapias reparativas en Facebook y YouTube. Esto dio resultados positivos culminando la resolución número 533 del 2019 de la Junta Examinadora de Psicólogos de Puerto Rico para prohibir el ofrecimiento de terapias de conversión o reparativa para cambiar la orientación sexual o identidad de género de menores de edad. Actualmente nos encontramos haciendo investigaciones para evaluar las experiencias de terapia de la comunidad LGB, eh, en donde nos hemos topado con la diversidad de experiencias desde positivas hasta negativas. Algunas citas del estudio al explorar situaciones en terapia son Cuando se lo revelé, el último terapeuta me puso incómodo. Tal parecía que le preocupaba, que le, gust que le gustara o algo así. El penúltimo me refirió a un grupo de apoyo de ex gays auspiciados por un monasterio católico. Dos, la reacción de mi terapeuta fue la de convencerme de que estaba viviendo un momento de confusión y que era erróneo. Tres, la terapia con la psicóloga fue un poco sensible, pues esta me expresó que no podía saber si era homosexual si no había probado con una mujer. Ella no validaba mi homosexualidad. Estas son algunas de las expresiones sorprendentes de parte de la comunidad por falta de tiempo. Actualmente nos encontramos recogiendo las voces de la comunidad trans y no binaria y al parecer el panorama es más negativo aún. No me gustaría terminar sin brindar alguna recomendación personal. Según he podido observar en mi experiencia personal, tanto en Puerto Rico como en otras islas del Caribe, desconocen sobre los derechos humanos, especialmente aquellas personas que se dedican a la política. Recomiendo trabajar las colaboraciones desde una perspectiva no colonialista para atender este asunto. Asunto que no solo afecta a las comunidades LGBT y a las terapias reparativas, sino que afecta a todos los proyectos para garantizar justicia a diversas minorías. Debemos dejar los discursos igualitarios a un lado y comenzar a hablar de las diferencias y las diversidades. Todas las personas somos diversas y no existe tal cosa como la norma. Evidentemente, esto es un reto para los derechos. Sin embargo, cuando se hace justicia, las recompensas son infinitas. Now I would like Susan to continue. Thank you very much. Susan, you have the floor, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Susan Dorson. I'm from Suriname. I'm the chair of Women's Way Foundation. Um, I would like to share my part, my part in this story, which is not a pleasant one, but it is one that needs to that needs to help bring about change. When we're speaking about conversion therapy, I firsthand experienced what it is, what it feels like how much it hurts and how much it confuses you into thinking that you are not normal, thinking that you are not worthy, thinking that you are not even valid, don't even need to be alive. I was 12 when I came out to my mom and growing up in a religious family, um, being, a, being baptized Roman Catholic is, you grow up with these Christian values, you grow up with, the norms, everything that is this, the definite of right and wrong. Well, when it came to my sexuality, we all know the stories about Sodom and Gomorrah. We all know what the Bible says about people who are, have a different sexual orientation than heterosexual. So that, that's where it started. That's where the drama started. Um, I had to be rebaptized because to the Adventist Church, being baptized the Roman Catholic way is not the full baptism. You need to be fully covered, drenched in water for it to be holy and sanctified and for Jesus to take you up as a child of his. And I had to go through that all over again, just because I had a different sexual orientation. And standing in church and having everybody, everybody else around you praying for you that you change and laying their hands on you and asking God to forgive 
forgive you for your sins. And when you're standing there knowing after after dealing with dealing with your sexuality yourself for God knows how long, dealing with it yourself, accepting it for yourself, and then coming out, putting it out in the world and having everybody else around you condemn it is one of the worst feelings. It's one of the worst things that can happen to an ind individual because it takes a lot from you as a person to accept your own sexuality, especially in a world where you know that people will look, look at you in a bad way, that people will try to harm you, people will try to fight you and try to get you to change. Sexuality is not some switch that you turn on and off. Like, I, don't, I, I can't imagine, you know, in, in 10,000 years that I would just wake up one morning and decide that the only support system I have, my mom and my siblings, they were the only ones I have that I would just decide, oh, today's a good day to make them hate me. Today's a good day to make them not want me around. Today's a good day to make them not love me anymore. It's not some switch that you turn on and off. Your sexuality is part of who you are. You can't change that and no conversion therapy can. Um, I also was brought to a psychologist to talk and for someone who you think is going to help you understand what you're going through and helping you deal and cope with everything else changing around you because of you accepting who you are. For a person like that who went to school, who studied to become what they are, who studied, who studied to take their profession seriously, to tell you that maybe you should just listen to your mother. Maybe you should just try to like, just dim it down a bit until you're out of the house. Do you know what that is? I tried to dim it down. I tried, God knows I tried. It's not something you can dim down. It's something that's, it's who you are. And conversion therapy keeps hurting. It keeps hurting innocent people who are just finding ways to cope and finding ways to explain, express their, their true self, their genuine, authentic self. To do that to someone, I think that's that's the worst thing ever. So when we're speaking about this, do not take it lightly. Do not see it as it's a minor thing. And sexuality is not a phase. People who come out have spoken to themselves 10,000 times and have weighed out the option, should I do this, should I not, before they come out. And for them to have the courage to stand up and say, hey, this is who I am. And this is what I am, and I want you to accept this. It takes great effort, and I commend everybody who comes out and just stands their ground and be and is their self and tries to make this world a better place for everyone else. Because when it comes to human rights, when it comes to sexuality and human rights, when it comes to the church and sexuality and human rights, there are so many things that go wrong. There are so many things that need to be changed, but. I really, I truly believe that if we work on this together, we can change it. So the only thing I want to say is I know how hard it is. I've been there um, walking around people from church looking at you like you're some filthy, you don't even feel like a person. I've been depressed for the majority of my teenage years. I've, I've, I've had to deal with um, anxiety and just nervousness and try and the thing is that was the only problem me and my mom had that was the only thing that was the only thing that me and my mom had when i was 12 and i was 12 and then i was 15 and i was 17 until i moved out i, I was i was doing my best at school i was doing everything that i could to be a good daughter to be a good person but my sexuality kept people from I think that taught me is to look at individuals and what feelings they have towards other people. Um, let's just look at the individual for who they are and not what their sexuality is, because it really hurts a lot. It destroys everything you think you had, especially family. When when I when I came out, it was so hard to live in one house with my mom because she she just couldn't understand. She just could not understand. And she thought that, why is God punishing her by sending me into her life and making me this way? Is God punishing her for something she did wrong? When 
It was just that people interpret the Bible however they want to, because I believe that if you look at the Bible, if you look at the things that the Bible says, why, why not look at the good things? Why not live with each other in harmony and find a space to accept each other for who we are and treat each other as equals? Because that, that's also one thing the Bible says. But people choose to take the bad things and focus on that and weaponize that to hurt other people. So my only thing that I want to say is let us love each other, respect each other, and try to make this world a better place for the people who come after us and for ourselves. Um, I think I, I, I kept it short because I know that I said everything I wanted to say. Thank you for giving me space to say this. Um, I'm 27 now. I made, I came a long way and I, I'm true, I truly am who I want to be. I truly am where I want to be. And that's where I also put my efforts and everything I have into the work that we do at Women's Way Foundation to make sure that every other lesbian, bisexual, trans men out there have a space that they could go to, have people that they could talk to who understand what they're going through and will not let anything and try to tell them otherwise because you are a person you are worthy you are valuable thank you for your time if they can one minute i'll give three recommendations and i'll pass the word please, please one, minute. one minute please, one minute please. literally one minute uh, we have main recommendations that we want to give one is the caveat for the caribbean that includes the colonial era bans on same-sex relations that should end and the inclusion of anti-discrimination measures. We call the, the Inter-American Commission to tell the states to implement urgent measures, including legislative bans to protect LGBTIQ persons, especially minors, from all forms of so-called conversion therapy, including faith-based practices in accordance to international human rights standards, that all medical and mental health practitioners practitioners who offer and perform any form of conversion practices should have their licenses revoked and that there is a need to have greater awareness and discussion about conversion practices in the Caribbean and around the Americas within the inter-American system, including spaces like this thematic hearing. And we thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to express um, on behalf of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, our deep gratitude for this public hearing, for the braveness of sharing your deep experience, your suffering, your drama, findings, data, research, and giving visibility to a cruel human rights violation and giving voice to their victims and so now I, I have the honor to give the floor to Commissioner Margaret McCauley, who is uh, the Rapporteur for Afro-Descendants Rights and Women's Rights. Please, Margaret, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I was hoping you would go first, but, but ne never mind. I, I, um, I have been in human rights for over 40 years, for going to 50. That's how old I, I am, right? And in the Caribbean, the documents, the, the, what was prepared for us as an information sheet is quite right. Conversion therapy, I don't know of any discussion which uh, I was invited to all my, my, the, the organizations I belong to and which we had on conversion therapy. First of all, in years gone by, the subject wasn't discussed at all. And I have to say that in even later years, I have not heard of any discussion in relation to conversion therapy in Jamaica and other Caribbean countries that I've worked in. And I think your percentage of 93% of Jamaicans who say that, uh, that they believe that uh, um, uh, sexual uh, orientation which differs from theirs is a sin, you're right in that. 
because all people who I speak to are over the years when this subject started coming up um, was being discussed uh, um, sometimes um, on radio programs, TV programs, and so on. And as head of the National Women's Group, um, I would be called to, to go and, and discuss the issue. Um, it, it, it was extremely difficult for me. Um, one, I was a Roman Catholic, a practicing one. And two, I was arguing from the position against the popular position. Uh, um, but I, I tended to put my arguments in a very basic human way. First of all, I asked, who were they to sit in judgment against other human beings? I said, who qualified you to do so? And why you talk about God and it is right and it is a sin and so on and rest on the issue of faith and religion. And yet you are behaving against Christ's teachings that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. So you are saying that you have decided a whole group of people are not your neighbors. How dare you do that? I, how, how can you do that on what basis? And I remember on one occasion, and I believe I was, was on radio because I, it was the two, there were two of us, a pastor of one of the religions um, that set themselves up. And we had lots of um, American so-called pastors who come and set up all these various kinds of churches. And um, I, being on radio, I was at home and he was uh, where I was. And he went on in the usual way, which really upset me. And I asked, I said to him that as far as I was concerned, he ought to tear and cut down his language because as a pastor, to my mind, every word he said was a sin against humanity. I said, and secondly, I think you are protesting too much against homosexuality. It was mostly homosexuality. He didn't mention lesbianism at all. And I told him that at that time, I had 13 dogs. I said, and two of them are homosexual. So how can you say it was against nature? I said, because I have two dogs. I said, you can come to my house and see them perform. And of course he could have no answer, but he was vexed with, very angry with me when I said that he was protesting too much. And I went further and I said, I, I know that some people may be talking out against homosexuality because they may be insecure in themselves. But instead of being quiet, they tend to attack other people and, and try to dehumanize them and exclude them from the, 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 the human persons. I, I, some of my members, the members of my organization were happy with the stance. I said, but we cannot, we're human rights group for women's rights. We have to protect that position. And I also held that position and convinced them that we have to, also with the Caribbean group TAFRA. And so, it, and, and we would speak out when um, attack in public, in public orientation people were killed by people part of the community so it, it is it is not 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 none of that conduct has happened lately but i think it's under it's still there under the level of 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 like the hidden because they now know because the police was made clear that they had to act to protect every person from uh, assaults and, and so on. 
So in a way, we're advancing slowly, but too slowly. And that's it's the same for all English Caribbean countries, which is based, we still have all the English legal provisions on our books, the laws of Bogbury and so on. The first of all, the language is so archaic that one wonders why you would keep such language in the law books. So we do need all the help we can in the region to, to try at least and bring our laws um, in line with international standards in, 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 in this regard. And to get people to understand that when you react that way against LGBTI persons, you are the kind of person who will react and disown someone who was born with a physical disability or a mental disability. But it's not a disability that LGBTI people have. They are who they are. And, and someone, some, first, I, 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 I really, you can, you can see my, my thing. I don't understand the thinking. If we are human beings, all of us are human beings, how can you say that these people have to be forcibly changed from who they are? This is, I, 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 it's too much for me. And I try the best we can. Um, and in fact, I should say this uh, as a disclosure. When I was going out for re-election, some groups, faith-based human rights groups in Jamaica published, sent a letter to what the main newspaper here, attacking, it was an attack against me. They were asking the government to withdraw their nomination of me as a candidate for re-election in the commission because I am supportive of LGBTI rights. So it still happens, but the government's position was, we chose you, we still have uh, faith in you and we're re um, um, uh, not doing anything to them. And they replied to their letter. So the government of Jamaica is not taking an active position one way or the other, I don't think, because they're not changing the laws, but they are not encouraging uh, um, uh, harmful uh, positions, abusive positions, discriminatory positions. So we have to so urge them to take the leap to change the laws and, and pass uh, positive laws. Thank you. Thank you so much, my dearest sister, Margaret. Now I give the floor to Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, please. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Um, my iPad. <laughs> I was thinking about uh, speaking in English first, and then I will change to, to Spanish, because I know that there is so many people listening to this hearing. I'd like to start saying thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony, for your work. Uh, and I would like that everybody that is listening now, not only you, but everybody, feel this message from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Because this, everything that you said, are violations of human rights. This is not something that I like, I don't like, this is my religious freedom. No, this is something related to human rights. And it is important to know, because when you start using the language of the human rights, you have to start thinking about uh, international and local responsibility. And when you talk about violation of human rights, you can uh, uh, see victims. And victims of human rights abuses have the right to reparation. And the sta state has the duty of repair these victims. Ahora cambio para poder plantear el, el, lo, lo demás que quería más precisión. En primer lugar, eh, yo estaba escuchando cada una de, la, de los testimonios, que nuevamente agradezco, 
también la información general de los reportes, y quería hacer una línea muy rápida de, de, de los aspectos que, que identifico aquí. En primer lugar, eh, estas llamadas, entre comillas, terapias de conversión, que son como una negación de la realidad, porque no se puede convertir, esto ya lo tenemos claro, parece que no todo el mundo, lamentablemente, constituyen con cada uno de los testimonios que ustedes nos han dado, no solamente tratos crueles, inhumanos o degradantes, sino que también eventualmente actos de tortura. Los elementos de la tortura son estos, ¿no? un sufrimiento, un fin determinado, un impacto y un daño. Entonces yo creo que es muy importante tener esto presente, porque la tortura, independientemente que los tratados hayan ratificado o no determinadas convenciones, sea la específica sobre tortura o incluso la convención americana, la prohibición de la tortura es parte de las normas de Jus Cogen, es parte del derecho constitucional, es la base de la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos y de la Declaración Americana también de los Derechos Humanos. Y digo esto porque me parece importante entender que ya la jurisprudencia de la Corte Interamericana, a partir del caso Linda López contra Venezuela, habla de la responsabilidad estatal, incluso cuando los hechos de tortura son cometidos por particulares. Incluso en ese caso, la Corte habló de la grosera omisión, grosera omisión del Estado ante los hechos de violencia sexual que en ese caso se verificaban. Y cuando se habla de una grosera omisión, cuando los hechos son totalmente conocidos, no es algo que sea oculto. Ustedes nos han hablado de centros, hablado de colegios, de terapias, es decir, hay algo totalmente conocido. Hay un principio, además, digo yo, de debida diligencia reforzada. ¿Por qué? Porque Caleb y Susan han, han, iniciado, han tenido estos, este sufrimiento desde niños y niñas, desde la niñez, que es una categoría protegida, el tema del interés superior del niño. Vienen ahora hablando y al escucharlos, yo he sentido a ese niño, a esa niña, con el mismo sufrimiento de ese momento. Entonces, ahí ya hay un cruce de la protección. Eh, y, y, y ustedes, hay muchísimas personas adultas que recién pueden empezar a hablar y a denunciar y a darse cuenta incluso del sufrimiento sufrido. En ese sentido, yo sé que en el reporte está toda la información que nos puedan a, a, a alcanzar en escuelas, en centros de atención, eh, eh, hospitales, pero también centros de atención terapéutica instituciones religiosas, personas privadas de libertad, cómo se les trata a las personas trans, cómo son clasificadas o recluidas. Eh, el tema además, eh, porque ustedes han hablado de situaciones que, que implican recursos, ¿no? recursos eh, físicos, recursos de, de personas, eh, recursos económicos, instituciones, toda la información. Porque cuando un hecho no es aislado, podríamos empezar a hablar, digo yo, de un patrón, ¿no? De un, de un hecho general que se constituye un patrón. Y cuando hay un patrón de violaciones de derechos humanos, fundamentalmente en, ter, en temas de tortura, la responsabilidad del Estado es incluso mayor. Esto, como digo, eh, es como... Me van a perdonar, eh, pero es que realmente estoy impactada al escucharlos. Esto es algo tan conocido, era algo tan visible, que cómo no se vio. Ahí viene la grosera omisión y que constituye responsabilidad del Estado. ¿no? Hay, una, hay una impunidad enorme, ¿no? y por eso el testimonio de cada uno de ustedes y de las personas que han contestado la encuesta y el informe es tan importante, por eso es tan importante. Quiero terminar entonces, porque, claro, porque esta situación nos habla de impunidad institucional, recordando algo, ya que muchas de las referencias han sido para instituciones religiosas, ¿no? con el mayor respeto que existe para la libertad religiosa, eh, pero tanto la discriminación por la, la fe religiosa constituye un motivo prohibido, no se puede discriminar a nadie por, por su fe religiosa, pero la orientación sexual, la identidad de género, la expresión de género también son categorías protegidas, ¿no? De manera específica. La Corte ya lo ha dicho, cuando la Convención Americana habla de sexo, está incluyendo además, y se tienen que incluir en la interpretación, orientación sexual, identidad de género, que no solamente son motivos prohibidos de discriminación, también forma parte de la vida privada. Es que, es, es que se ha violado no solamente este derecho a ser, a ser, a existir, sino también la vida privada, la esencia 
que los derechos humanos es la dignidad, se perdió durante mucho tiempo por varios años, viene trabajando esta noción de la fe religiosa para los derechos humanos. La fe, hay principios, 18 principios sobre la fe religiosa para los derechos humanos. ¿Qué significa? Que ningún discurso vinculado a una fe religiosa puede utilizarse para apañar o justificar un acto de tortura o de odio. Y la Corte ya habla de violencia por prejuicio. Eh, y con todo el respeto, eh, eh, siendo yo bautizada católica, la esencia de la Biblia era, Juan, San Juan lo dice en su evangelio, ¿qué dijo Jesús? Y Jesús dijo, amaos los unos a los otros. Y el amor implica el respeto, el reconocimiento a la libertad. Y yo en sus testimonios he escuchado y he sentido tanto amor, porque venirse a hablar acá es amor a todas otras personas que han podido pasar lo mismo. Tienen nuestro respeto, nuestro agradecimiento y el mayor apoyo y energía para que sigan adelante. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, comisionada Julissa. Ahora cedo la palabra al comisionado Estuardo Ramírez. Por favor, comisionado, tiene la palabra. Muchas gracias, comisionada. Un saludo a mis colegas comisionadas, redactor de Libertad de Expresión, secretaria ejecutiva, y quisiera empezar haciendo un reconocimiento a todas las personas que están hoy en esta audiencia importante. Y en ese reconocimiento también hacer un énfasis en la valentía de Susan, de Caleb, de poder hoy transmitir eh, un testimonio de situaciones totalmente la esencia de los derechos humanos nace precisamente de la dignidad humana, la dignidad que tienen todas las personas. Y precisamente por esa dignidad deben ser tratadas con respeto y es totalmente inadmisible que puedan existir cualquier método de violencia mental y que venga, digamos, a hacer un trato totalmente cruel, inhumano y degradante como ustedes lo han manifestado. Creo que este es un informe, sobre todo enfocado a situaciones por la, la audiencia temática en el Caribe, y comprometer nuestra labor como comisión de que no sean admitidos, sino condenados y censurables todos aquellos tratos que atenten contra la dignidad de las personas. Así que quería hacer ese reconocimiento. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, comisionado Estuardo. Ahora la palabra cedo a Pedro Vaca, que es el para la libertad de expresión. Por favor. Muchas gracias, eh, comisionado Carlos Pedesan, a todas las comisionadas, comisionado Carlos Ralón, secretaria ejecutiva, a todos los y todas las participantes. Eh, yo creo que en definitiva estamos asistiendo a tiempos que son eh, esperanzadores, porque creo que como nunca eh, se está hablando de tener más y no menos derechos, y creo que la conquista de derechos por parte de la comunidad LGBT es algo que no puede tener reversa y que tiene que ser la sociedad la que permita su inserción y reconocimiento y no la regresión. Creo que parte de la agenda de libertad de expresión también tiene que ver con cómo eh, avanzar en que se tengan siempre más, nunca menos derechos. En esta línea, eh, digamos, yo creo que ciertamente eh, lo que se ha tratado en esta audiencia es uno de los de las tensiones más difíciles de libertad de expresión que tiene nuestro continente. ¿no? Entre otras cosas porque eh, el argumento de libertad de expresión se esgrime desde los distintos ángulos y, y sectores de la sociedad, eh, aun cuando pueda ser, digamos, eh, insisto, yo creo que la clave o por lo menos la variable que yo invitaría a, a tener en cuenta es nunca retroceder en derechos. La libertad de expresión que se ejerce para que otros no ejerzan derechos, creo que es una 
libertad de expresión que no cumple con los estándares de pluralismo a lo que aspira, por lo menos, eh, la libertad de expresión en las Américas. Con eso yo quiero plantear más unas preguntas que pueden ser complementarias. Me gustaría saber en el Caribe cómo está el debate público frente a esto. Es decir, se nos ha hablado de unos, de unos, de unos testimonios, de unas iniciativas legislativas, pero ¿cómo está el debate? Por lo menos a tres niveles, digamos. Para. El primero es si, eh, por ejemplo, los medios de comunicación toman como puente a la comunidad LGBT en, en los reportajes y el seguimiento parlamentario que se hace a estos temas. Eh, la segunda es la presencia de la comunidad LGBTI en los propios medios de comunicación. Si existen, si dentro de los medios tradicionales hay presencia eh, y participación y hay periodistas eh, que pertenezcan a la comunidad. Eh, y eh, la tercera tiene que ver con eh, expresiones o medios de comunicación o plataformas desde de donde se ejerce la libertad de expresión de la propia comunidad LGBT. ¿Por qué digo esto? Porque creo que al margen del diseño institucional, que es muy importante, ¿sí? eh, al margen de los estándares internacionales que debemos observar nosotros, creo que eh, buena parte de los sectores que pueden entrar a oprimir derechos de la comunidad también tienen medios de comunicación, también hacen parte de otros circuitos donde su opinión ya pesa bastante y tengo la sensación de que la opinión de la comunidad LGBT en todo el hemisferio eh, no está tan insertada ni está puesta en el volumen suficiente eh, dentro del debate público. Luego me gustaría, ojalá, que pudieran profundizar sobre este asunto. Y muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, uh, relator Pedro. Um, I'd like to share two general comments and one question. Uh, I have the honor to serve the LGBTI rights reportership, and I'd like to emphasize our, all our effort and commitment, strong commitment to this cause, to the promotion, to the protection of the most fundamental right one can have is the right to be. That's the right to develop the personality in a free, autonomous uh, way. So uh, my first general do with the three reports that we adopted. And for us, it's very important to get more information. So if you could send to the reportership all the valuable information that will be very Our first report that we, that we adopted in 2015 uh, focused on um, violence against LGBTI rights in the America. The second that we adopted last year uh, was about recognizing LGBTI rights in the Americas, challenges and best places. And the third one that we just adopted weeks ago, and we had a, a public webinar about that with um, our, our dearest um, reportership on social, economic, and cultural and environmental rights uh, was about trans persons and access to economic, social, and cultural rights. In all of those three reports, we highlight the dramatic consequences of these so-called conversion therapies. But I do agree that we have to emphasize the human rights approach, highlighting that rights are being violated and duties, state duties, should be, we should call state to develop prevention measures and to react and to investigate and to process and to punish and to repair. So uh, first, my first comment has to do with those three reports Our legal discourse based on the Inter-American Corpus Jury and the language of rights, persons' rights and state duties, legal duties. Uh, my second comment has to do with the Caribbean region. According to our strategic plan, we have this priority to get closer to the Caribbean, to understand more the Caribbean realities. So uh, with my dearest, friend Victor Madrigal, 
we organized last October a consultation, a Caribbean consultation uh, that we organized jointly, the UN, the Commission, OAS, and Commonwealth. Uh, and focusing on inclusion of LGBTI rights. Uh, so adopting the framework of 2030 agenda on development, but addressing the key issue of criminalization because nine countries, nine Caribbean countries is still criminalized. And for the commission, the criminalization per se is a serious human rights violation. And the serious and grave human rights violation implies in a universe of other human rights violations. So we are addressing uh, this, this challenge. Uh, we will have in January another consultation with the UN following up this process. So we are identifying the strategies to move this agenda in the Caribbean region. So count on all our commitment. And my question, having said that, my question is co uh, concerns about best practice. So all of us, we all of us, we got really, we got really touched about all, all our, you know, the dramatic situation, the experience. Uh, all this consequence regarding suicide, depression, humiliation. So it's devastating. It's just devastating. So uh, my question is how to change that? How to ad identify uh, lessons learned, best practice in three fields, preventive measures, campaigns, which could be effective, raising capacity building programs, um, and if there is in the region um, emblematic cases of, uh, you know, of censoring this, this, this practice uh, by the judicial system, for example, I got really um, concerned about uh, the drama of, of mental health. So if there is, if there are cases of reparations in terms of mental health providing uh, access to mental service. And uh, I, I'd like to learn more. Kayla was sharing the experience of Puerto Rico, the law which prohibits uh, conversion, the so-called conversion practice or conversion therapy. And this challenge of embracing the private sphere because the law as I understood just is focused on the public sphere and not the private sphere. And then it comes all the, the religious leaders and so on and so forth. So um, for, the, for the commission to be very important, of course, to address this matter from a human rights approach in the language of human rights violations, it's torture and state legal duties. And, and for us, it would be important to learn best practice in the region. So thank you so much. I give you the floor uh, for 16 minutes. And then President, can I just ask one question which I forgot to ask and clarify please, one please point. have the floor, my sister, please. And thank you so much. I just wanted to clarify the point in relation to the attack on me by some faith-based uh, groups that the, net, the human rights network groups, which is a large, uh, um, in Jamaica did come out publicly in support and answered in the press the, 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 the smearing and pointed out that human dignity and the rights of all people were what we were co uh, concerned with and not their choosing groups as they did. And then the, the question which I wanted to ask which was of particular interest to me is the the um, um, sexual violations of lesbians, especially. Uh, and and uh, um, what I wanted to ask, what, 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 based on best practices, on what do you have in your knowledge and experience on the ground of how we can encourage human rights groups in the Caribbean to actively bring matters to the courts so that they can bring them into the, 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 the um, 
commission thereafter because the way the laws are in some of these countries, in our countries, we will need to have these legal interventions made to how that can be done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I, I just like to highlight that for, for the inter-American system, uh, equality and non-discrimination is more than a fundamental principle, is more than a basic principle of international human rights law, is part of use cogens, meaning is a peremptory law. So uh, I give you the floor for 16 minutes. I still kept it. Thank you so much, commissioners and special rapporteur on all your comments and questions. We do understand that 16 minutes is not enough to address all those really big and important questions that you've made right now, but we'll make sure to report in writing to you after this hearing with a lot of information, including both reports from Outright Action International, the global one and the one specifically on the Caribbean region. And another point that I'd like to highlight before giving the word to my colleagues colleagues who have a lot more knowledge to share than I do. Uh, Outright Action International is currently uh, having a survey on the so-called gender ideology in the Caribbean that will bring a lot of the information that the special rapporteur has asked about the media, about participation and everything that is happening in the Caribbean from the voices within the region, which is something that we'll also be very happy to share the moment we do have the analysis on the survey and the final report in the near future. Um, and I'd like to open the floor to my colleagues, Ami, Kayla, and Susan to address your questions and to make final comments as well. Thank you. I, I actually, many of these questions, I think I need, to, I, I really must defer to Caleb and Susan regarding the media, regarding specific issues that are, are uh, faced in the Caribbean. But to the question of best practices, I think it's really important to underscore, as several of you have pointed out, that this phenomenon happens behind closed doors. Although it's generally acknowledged that to exist, it's very, there's very little discourse about it. And so, part of our efforts to start to document openly what's happening is about ultimately getting to what would be the, the right strategies, the best practices to curtail and eradicate these practices. So one thing I do wanna mention, it's not specific to the Caribbean region, but Outright is planning in um, the beginning part of next year, first quarter of next year, we hope, to convene a global consultation on pathways towards eradicating these practices. Because we know from various case studies around the world um, that there are various, there, there are these kinds of legislative bans. There, there are also um, examples of strategic litigation actually in the US, in China involving um, charges. The, the, the premise, the, the legal premise is that the services being offered, whether by religious uh, institutions by by mental health providers, whoever, are are uh, fraudulent and based on false advertising. So it's an interesting angle to getting at some of the practitioners that evade more formal um, laws in the in the formal sector. Uh, so there's there and then there are also uh, approaches towards the sanctioning, as Louisa mentioned in our recommendations of professionals who engage um, in these practices. Uh, but fundamentally in the Caribbean and in other places where criminalization laws still exist, until those laws are, are, are abandoned, you know, are revoked, it makes it very, very difficult it, it, in a matter of, you know, in, in terms of the environment that exists already to advance these issues when when you're being told in a legal framework that who you are is actually criminalized. In fact, it's what you do, not who you are, but the interpretation is often who you are. And so fundamentally, the, the conditions um, that lead to this sense of not being acceptable, not being accepted to being patho pathological, 
um, th those conditions need to be addressed fundamentally. But of course, there are very targeted interventions that we also want to look at um, and what have been tried in other countries as well as what still could be tried going forward. So I'll stop there because I, I want to give plenty of time to my colleagues from the region to address some of your more specific questions. Thank you. All right, I can talk a little bit about Puerto Rico. Um, definitely, I think the LGBT community have visibility in the news and the media, uh, but usually they want to have like both sides. So LGBT community usually speak, but they usually visibilize like the religious people too. And what happened is that they usually use different words like the secret agenda that usually they start like talking about if, if this law is um, approved, uh, they have a secret agenda and the secret agenda and they start like making some stuff that people get scared. So people say, oh no, we, we cannot approve that because the secret agenda. Uh, the secret agenda is just stuff they um i don't know it's uh it's all made up um so usually as as the person said um usually religious people have tv channels they have radio stations they have a lot of visibility so they have a lot of more uh interacting with people that lgbt community usually have some community people who speak when they ask for it but they don't have like a channel they don't have like a like a media that they can be like all the time um, giving right information um i forgot about the other questions so if, if you can remind me oh the best practice is well, in psychology, best practice for LGBT community who want help is affirmative therapy. Affirmative therapy is not um, a therapy model because LGBT community doesn't need therapy for uh, sexual orientation or gender identity, but they need therapy for the homophobia, transphobia, biphobia uh, consequences. So um, the affirmative therapy is a way to include to another therapy. So you can be affirmative to the sexual orientation and gender identity. And a good thing of the affirmative therapy is that you can integrate that in other frameworks, not only clinical therapy, but outside. So I would recommend um, to keep looking for affirmative therapy and usually it is called transaffirmative therapy when it's um, directed for trans and non-binary community. And the last question about the inclusion of women, I think uh, we need a lot of empowerment, not only for women, but for the feminist people, because at least in Puerto Rico, the word feminist have been like a bad word when you say someone is feminist, it's like, oh, feminist. And people think they are like a criminal group that um, you, <laughs> like, uh, they do criminal stuff to get rights, like they in like in pawn things and stuff. And right, so people, I think with education, we need to know what feminist is, that feminist is for everyone. A lot of people is feminist and they don't even know because they think feminist is the same of embrims that is usually the woman superior. So I think definitely education and I think we need to do more community-based practices and, um, and stuff. So that's my recommendation in that way. Susan, would you like to jump in? Well, I would like to say that um, when looking at, for example, how do you create awareness and how do you um, try to be still be in contact with people who are general community, 
and your own community. Um, what we do is at Women's Ways, we, we try to create our own radio programs in which we talk about everything, starting from gender stereotypes and how to break them at home, at school, at work, um, talking about um, everything, just terminology, basic terminology, because the misunderstandings always come from people not knowing enough, not being aware enough, not being educated enough. So every chance we get to educate, every offer we get to be included in some program, some TV interview, some radio interview, we just go. Because we know that the more we speak about this, especially because for Suriname, our country at the OAS said that um, they are not aware of the LGBTs in the country. They still have to have this huge um, discussion about it. So coming from that, knowing what they say abroad about Suriname, when meanwhile we have, have been doing surveys with 140 respondents who are all LBQTM, and them not acknowledging us. We know that the work that we have to do locally is a lot more than the work that we're doing regionally because regionally we get more, how do you say it, um, credit or visibility when doing our campaigns than locally because our government for some reason will not acknowledge or does not want to engage in even starting the conversation about all the things that need to happen. So what, what we try to do is try to go from another direction and just trying to get social events, social cohesion events, going out and having a caravan with information so that we can just talk to, to people about this. Um, and I think that um, we, we need to do more of that, of course, but also like we're trying to like get into conversations with, with religious um, leaders. And there are a few in Suriname who have had conversations with us and really promote um, the, the 10 commandments as to be their core when it comes to religion and and, 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 sex, and sexuality together. And I think that that's a good approach because if you focus on the 10 commandments, nowhere in the 10 commandments, someone ever said something about LGBTs. It's just be love your, your, your fellow people as you love yourself, respect your elders, do not steal, do not kill, do not. So if, you, if we keep those 10 core values as humans, I think, the Bible would be accessible for everyone because I still till this day believe that um, my my creator loves me. You, you may call him God, you may call him Shiva, you may call him Allah, whatever you may call him. I believe that he loves me. I believe that he, she put me here on this earth for a mission and my mission is to create awareness and help wherever I can. And I truly believe that they provide for me every day. They make sure that I am who I am. And um, I don't think that any priest, priests or whatever can tell me otherwise. So that's, yeah. Thank you so Did much. Did I miss one more question? Did I miss one more question? I think I missed one question. I think you addressed them all, but do you have any final comments, Susan? Final comment would be to everyone listening to this, to everyone seeing this, try to be kind, try to be gentle, try to be understanding. Because when I say love, each other I mean all of those things all the above because love is not something that you can disconnect from respect and disconnect from understanding and disconnect from being kind love is a it's a full-bodied word that has so much more meaning than we as humans give it so let's try to love each other and try to make this world a better place and in the name of our right and everyone who's here today from civil society. I just like to thank again the Inter-American Commission for holding this space and having this conversation. And we hope to continue this conversation in other spaces and in other opportunities. And we'll make sure to send everything in writing so you can continue doing this work together with us. Thank you so much. On behalf of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, we would like to express our deep gratitude, our more, most sincere recognition and commitment to defend, to protect the right to be without discrimination, without humiliation, without hostility. But enforcing the language of, so thank you so much. Susan, Susan and Khalid, thank you so much and love you and respect you and hope you will be around a long time working in what you're doing. And thank you all of you others.
for what thank you, you. Thank love you. have a good christmas <laughs> Bye. Thank, thank you. you so much <laughs>